did my full education, leaving Fert the user in Glasgow, and left, went to work, I worked in the libraries department in, in Glasgow, enjoyed it, Enjoy, I enjoyed working with books, and I made friends there too, and my social life, I had a very good social life, most of my friends were like myself, we had an Irish background, or we shared similar interests, and we met regularly, and we all went dancing, and as a result of my going dancing, I met my husband in a place called, of all places, the Bundoran Club, and it was uh, people of my type, if you like, went to meet the, a future partner. So I met Jack there and went out for about two years. We became engaged and we got married and I eventually settled in Glasgow. He worked with the post office, he was a post office engineer in, in Glasgow. But there's a certain, um, how will I put it, a religious divide. And being a Catholic, you didn't come in top of the league for no matter how many qualifications are. In those days, you didn't come in top of the league for being uh, get a proper job. A friend of mine was going to dancing, and she just said to me at one stage, "Would you um, like to go to dancing?" I think it was about seven, and my mum sort of said, "Yeah, no problem." So that's where, when I started, I did my teacher's exam at that stage. But just before that, when I was competing, I won eight All-Ireland titles, and uh, that was a record. I've uh, been a professional musician for years, but I always had a huge interest in astrology which was nurtured by my father, who was very interested in all things psychic. And I enjoyed all that. And I learned about uh, doing horoscopes, to, which involves an awful lot of calculations. And I enjoyed it. I became very successful in astrology in that uh, I was still working as a musician, but uh, I preferred to do the star signs. And I, ended up doing a programme on RTE1 called Live at Three. And it was hugely popular. It used to go out every day from three o'clock till four. And I did that for 12 years. I, one November day in 1964, a cold day, I went into a caravan in uh, where the builder was at his office and I put down a deposit of £100 for a house in Sutton Park. Now, Sutton Park was there. It, 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 there were lands that were uh, made of uh, sandy lands, and they, they, most of the, uh, the sand and the gravel was scraped off it for the building of Cabra and Merino. And that's where uh, uh, Farrelly brothers, a number of brothers, uh, Curtis and Farrelly, were all the same group. They built their houses. But there was nothing in Bayside at the time. And he told me that Bayside were going to build luxurious houses over in, uh, over in Bayside. That didn't happen till later on. This was 19, I moved in in 1965. We moved into the house and we have lived there ever since, which is 58 years ago. And I was still in the same house. Take you back to the 1960s, a completely different Ireland. Uh, 1960s actually was, uh, there's a lot of optimism in the air. Uh, the economy had kind of thrown around. And of course, the big event of the 1960s was the visit of John F. Kennedy, the American president. And that gave us all a lift of morale. Uh, all I know is that uh, for, for us, uh, two youngsters as we were at the time in our middle 20s, started house hunting. And uh, we came across uh, this new concept from Bayside. Now, we knew nothing about it. But uh, when we saw it, it looked nice. And of course, the most important thing was, uh, you know, it was affordability. Uh, based on my salary at the time, it was in the price range. So we had a look and uh, learned as much as we could about it before we built and made the decision, take a big chance and purchase the house before, on plans before it was built. But it turned out to be probably the best investment. Second best, the first one was Marion Collette, obviously. If you look at, presently on that road, slightly to your left, you'll see two blocks of houses, four in each block, and we were on the inside four, and that was it. Uh, it was eight, eight, eight uh, residents uh, moving in, and uh, beyond that, it was uh, a building site. And uh, in fact, our address at that time was site 671 Bayside, County Dublin, 
we hadn't even got double numbers at the time. So that's a long, long time ago. But uh, that was the start. And obviously the houses continued to build and build. And uh, as I said, it was nice open areas, a very safe place for children. Because uh, once the builders were left, there was very little true traffic. Bayside was only 4,485. And then we bought this eight years later. This was 16,000. My father's company, Sarto Homes, were building the houses here. I, I worked on the site here and um, I was able to uh, pick this particular house, marker out on the plans, put an X on it, telling everybody it was sold. When people came to actually have a look and deal with auctioneers, and all that was sold. And uh, so I've been here in, in Bayside ever since for the 44 years. We like to look at the houses and there was certain space and we like the fact that we were near the sea and there was plenty of space. We weren't sitting, houses weren't on top of each other, if you know what I mean. Uh, Waits was the original builder here in Bayside and where this house stands is where the site compound uh, actually was uh, for, for Waits. And this is one of the last houses to be, to be built along here. There was definitely challenges on, on, on some of the land here in Bayside because it, was, uh, it would have been swamp here at one stage and it was a raft type foundation had to be built on uh, certain houses. I'm not going to mention any of where the raft foundations are now. But the houses are still standing and that, that's, that is the main thing. There's no trees or anything. There's nothing really. And, but I got to know every, everybody on the road. And we managed the best way we could. And there were two bunk beds on that side. And Rosie slept in the top one because she was the oldest, and I thought the young ones might have, the younger one might have fallen out, but she was a bit more stable. So Rosie was in the top bunk, uh, the Claire I think would be in the bottom bunk, and on this side it was Imelda and Ethna, one in the top and one in the bottom. But I mean they had no floor space between them, you know, they weren't uh, sitting lying on top of each other, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and the boys were the same, the boys did the bunk bed. Ben had a single bed and the other two, Neil and Fergal, they shared the bunks, one in top and one in And well, it wasn't perfect by a, lot, any, by a long chalk, but it was either a moving house and we couldn't afford to move house at that stage, so it was just put up, shut up and go on with it. They also, in a lot, they decided on my road, Sutton Downs, they would build a few, a one big section of maisonettes. And maisonettes were meant, I think, mainly for people to retire to. They are either a downstairs with the care of the garden or two stories on top of that downstairs so that you have the effect of a little house but it doesn't have a garden for you to worry about. There are 12 of those and they were built as part of this idea that people who wanted to live here all their lives could live here. to Bayside it was the old Bayside as people remember when the shops were very old looking they were kind of like stuck in this early 70s even though it was the 80s when we moved here and we had a look at the shop I think it was called the lantern back then and the layout of the place was totally different and we decided I said that the area itself looked lovely it was a lovely little community area and I said this is nice so we decided we'd go for it and after about two weeks when we were there, one of the neighbours came in to me and said, are you living in the number of the house up the road? And I said, yes. She said, did you just move in? I said, you know, we're just there about two weeks. Well, I'm just letting you know that your front door is wide open. I think your house was broken into. <laughs> but we were the takeaway in the area at the time. It was very different. And I think Bayside kind of felt, oh my God, do they actually want a takeaway in the area? Because it, it felt, I think, that it was going to give a bad name to the area, but as I was living in the area, I was going to make sure that wasn't going to happen. Well, of course, in 1966, this didn't exist. This was not a parish. And Bow Doyle was the parish church for this whole area, including Kibarrick, Foxfield, Port Marnock and Concealy. Bow Doyle. So I started off as an altar boy in Doyle, and then as this church was built then I was one of the first altar boys here in um, the church was opened here in 1971 
So it was, that was a very exciting time as well. And there were loads of altar boys. We were queuing up at that time to be altar servers. And when the church was opened by the Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, um, there was a protest by the Labour Party with placards walking up and down, protesting about the fact that the priests, they got three houses, uh, one for uh, each curate, one for two curates and a parish priest. And uh, people objected to that. Uh, the, at least the Labour Party objected to it. And there had to be a, uh, there was a guard of presence as well in case there was trouble. And I remember the priest restraining the guards. The guards wanted to break up the Labour Party protest. And Father Lamb said to the, said to the guard who was aiding forward, who was an aide of the area, uh, don't, 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 uh, let them, just let them have their protest and don't uh, interfere with them and stop them. So that was a bit of excitement that was here at the beginning. Being ordained here in the church was very, very important to me back in 1981. That's what, 42 years ago, and I could not really comprehend what has happened since then. Would you take that step? What a, a different world it is. And I had many positions after I was ordained here a priest by Bishop Jim Kavanagh. Um, I, w I went out to Bray first uh, as a teacher, and then to various parishes throughout Dublin. And then in 2015, I took a sabbatical where I was parish priest in Donny Carney. And when I came back, the Archbishop of Dublin then said, would you like to come to Bayside? And I said, well, I'd love to, but you do realize I grew up there. And he said for a minute, hmm. He said, well, they'll have forgotten about you by then. This was just fields. You know, there wasn't anything built. The school wasn't built because when I started school on Bayside, it was a prefab at the top of Boulevard North. And we used to just play in these fields. It was full of long grass, a stream, lots of wildlife. And it was just a magical place to be. I got to know Anne and I did sub at Bayside. Then what happened, Anne, after that? But the following year, uh, the following September, you um, came in a permanent job after the vice principal emigrated to New Zealand, Maura O'Connor. Yeah, Maura O'Connor. And Kathleen started her. Yeah, and that was the prefabs there. in Bayside, wasn't it? Yes. There were three prefabs in our beginning. The three prefabs which were delivered to the school on the 4th of September 1972 mm -hmm. and I think we entered the building with 74 pupils on about the 12th and at that stage um, the stairs weren't properly erected so we had to use the fire escape stairs to get into the classroom. Very primitive. Yeah and the toilets were in a separate block as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the noise of the train going past um, at that stage as well. Looking um, back, it was a bit of a nightmare, really. And we had no, well, it looked like we would have no equipment or anything like that, but the PP stumped up and we, an inspector came in the first week and he was amazed at all the equipment that we had and parents had clubbed in as well, I think. So we were set up to go. Well, then, then the school was built and we moved in. Um, we had eight classes, I think, at that stage, and we moved in into the school. I became involved in the community with um, a group set up by Mary Whelan, who was a sociologist, and we had uh, we got a prefab which we bought over on the south side of the city, and we built it here instead of where the community centre is now. And uh, we had a community information centre there, which we ran for a number of years. Yeah, well, the community centre was a, one of the biggest factors in, in the development of, of, of the area that we call Bayside, although it, it, it wasn't just for Bayside, it was for <coughs> Sutton Park, um, Verbeen and Alden, which were now okay, coming towards completion a, a number of years later. And uh, there was an awful lot of work done by very good people, two people in particular uh, that I remember, uh, uh, Sean Murakou and, and Tom Berry. 
There was other people as well involved as well, but they're too sick in my mind. Uh, I was asked just to do MC on the grand opening day. The opening, it was a big event. It was something that was needed and it took a while to, until it opened. But it became a great uh, source of uh, a place for pe people to have events, uh, various organisations, scouts, uh, some of the uh, uh, clubs, uh, the sporting clubs and so on. And uh, in, in order to raise a bit of funds, because it costs money to heat and light and all the rest of it, uh, I was called upon to, to help out on the bingo and became the, the resident bingo caller. <laughs> Great bit of fun, you know. Kelly's Eye, number one. Halfway to heaven, number seven, you know, you have them all. So uh, I did that for a number of years, every Sunday night. So uh, we, I just introduced by saying, it's Sunday night, it's Bayside, it's eight o'clock, it's bingo time. There was quite a, a political feel about um, Bayside as well. I mean, the women had a, quite a strong women's committee and they had been out protesting. So I'd seen that on placards and things. So they had been out protesting about a few activities on the, on the streets. So when they uh, decided that what was in the original plans with the weights design was a playground where the pub is now, um, they were done making it into a pub. So I got together with my friends and we made placards and we went out to pubs aren't for children we can't play in pubs and all these signs so and um, that was age 10 was my first um, political protest and my first sort of awareness of maybe things that were unjust and trying to make a difference people who were running the community center wanted to get a uh, license from and they were negotiating with Beamish and Crawford or Cork to get a license to open uh, their own uh, public house in the community centre. But this didn't happen. And uh, consequently, the uh, publicans uh, came and built their, uh, the Bayside Inn. But there was very, uh, it was featured on the Late Late Show, and it was featured, and, and two priests who were here, uh, Michael Casey and Michael Lamb at the time, they threw themselves in front of dumpers and everything. So there was great excitement at the time. But anyhow, it came to no consequence and the pub came to be built here. Most things that started up in Bayside uh, began out of just people wanting to do it together. There were drama groups, there were writing groups, there was a wonderful group where older women, much older than I am, well, somewhat older, decided that they would help t the younger ones learn the skills that women needed, especially in the 90s and when times became very hard in Ireland. And so they had, we had wonderful fun in what was called a craft club. It was one of 70 different clubs that at that time were using the community centre. It had a little niche in a back room on, uh, on Tuesday evenings and sewing machines would be brought in and there was kept there a cupboard full of fabric and yarn so that young wives could learn the skills that old wives already could pass on. And that's where I learned, for example, to make patchwork quilts by hand. Women's Forum. It was a new idea. And uh, women didn't raise their heads for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden this thing was announced that this women's forum was beginning somewhere. So there was the, the, the meetings in the hall and nobody knew really what was women's forum about. And uh, I remember listening to a pile of women came and a couple of them got up to speak. And it was very nice and um, proper and uh, sanitised. Uh, sanitised. <laughs> I remember being very annoyed with Rome at the time. <laughs> and the previous month, there was this great conf conference in Rome where bishops and archbishops and all this came, the Pope, of course, and uh, they discussed women's fertility with not a woman in sight. This was the opening of my speech that night in Bayside. And for some unknown reason, all hell broke loose. <laughs> and I was elected straight away. And it was funny how they changed all of a sudden. 
It was, and he heard that that's what they wanted to discuss, but everybody was afraid to, to break out kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was elected on this, and a young girl from the bottom of the road here was elected as well. And the two of us got together and we said, what are we doing? What, what, what are we going to do with this? And uh, we hadn't a clue, really, what it was about, or nobody was able to explain it to us as to where to go. And I said, the best thing we'll do is to get the best speakers there are at the moment. And we picked five. I remember Father McGrail. He was, he was a Jesuit. Not a great speaker, but he was well known at the time to be on rights of all kinds, not specifically women. So he didn't concentrate on women. Oh, yeah, we called it um, Crisis in the Church, Crisis in Society. Now, that's over 30... How many oh, years was that to go? 40, Catherine, is it? I don't know. It was after I came out from school, and I, that's the first thing I started, well, the Women's Forum. Well, how long, how long are you out now? 30. So there was a crisis in the church that time, if you remember. 30, so that was in... Yeah. So we 90. got... Um, Father McVeary came out. A lady called Gina Menzies, that was kind of vocal at the time. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, who else? Um, Mary McAleese. Mary McAleese was a big send out because we got it announced on radio that she was coming out that one of the nights. So she came here. She wasn't the Mary McAleese that landed in the, in the as a president. She was a very strong advocate of all sorts of rights. So she came and gave a great speech and the place was packed up in, up in, the, up in the church. We asked, could we get into the church with that? Now, the priests at the time, I don't know whether they're for or against. They were wary of the women's forum. But uh, after that, I don't know what happened, the women's forum. Oh, we, I remember being caught a left-wing pico at the time. And <laughs> it was kind of like when, when George Colley, um, the teachers were rumbling about conditions and pay and everything else, and he called us well-heeled, articulate women. <laughs> and that went down a bomb. Well-heeled we weren't. No. And, and that was the same attitude that came same from... Same attitude, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was a left-wing pinko. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know what left wing or right wing was. And I remember the final of that group of lectures. We we took a general view of it, kind of thing. And we the two of us spoke to the people. And men came that night, actually. And I told them what I'd been called, you know. And there was a great big laugh now at that. And I said, well, I love wearing pink. And I said, I don't want to know what left wing, right wing is, or whatever. <laughs> I never heard a women's forum after that or where it went. Someone said to me one time, have you never heard of contraception? And I thought, well, Holy Catholic Ireland, here we come right enough. Nobody in Glasgow would have asked me that, so Mrs, you can go and mind your own business. I did say that to her, but uh, I was very cool about it. And that's an aside I'm giving you anyway. The community was great here. It was sort of, um, uh, I think in a way it was an experiment of what it would be like in a community like this where it was very open. We had green fields like um, between each house, like squares where you could play games on and people could overlook the, the fields. And it was very, um, you know, intergenerational, cross generational. There was a lot of people, like say my grandparents would have moved out here to downsize and they would have moved into like two bedroom. So, you know, you tend to think of places like with housing estates of being like a lot of young, um, young families and the older generation aren't there. Whereas this was a new estate, but it had older people as well, which I think was part of the success of it. The very beginning, there was a great sense of community and togetherness which I think has gone on until today's time. But there was certainly a feeling of community, even from the very beginning, particularly when everything was starting afresh and there was a great excitement 
of trying to make this a good area and a good place to bring up children. Because a lot of, of course, a lot of the adults were quite um, newly married at the time with young children. Uh, weights were very good as builders because in the summer they uh, erected a marquee and invited all the, the residents to it to get to know each other. And that was very good because while well, we knew your next door neighbours and the ones near, near enough to you, further down Bayside as the houses were built, you, you mightn't necessarily have known them. So a very good community to spend sort of grew up in Bayside. Mrs Connor was a very, she was an, an inner city Dublin lady and she was a great neighbour and a very nice person. She liked the children. She and I liked her children. My, my, her daughter and one of my daughters are still friends. And then there were people, no, we had, on the whole, we had very good neighbours and we were all in the same boat and we were all anxious to get on with each other because we were all, as I say, some of from the country, some of from the inner city and me, I was the outsider with the Scottish accent, so that uh, <laughs> it was up to me to blend in and be like the others. No, I can't say, when I, honestly, when I think back, we had no major problems, you know. One or two annoyed you a bit, people giving out about kids in gardens and that sort of thing because we are all open plan. But you go over that and just, you, you warn the kids not to do it again. And, and they never believed you right enough, they still, they learned to live with it and that was it. I've enjoyed living in Bayside. It's a nice, quiet place. And the, the neighbours are lovely. I wouldn't imagine myself living anywhere else other than where I am. Human beings need to, to work with other human beings, uh, to do things together, to help each other in life. Mal and Oya August Chakushi praise the young and they will develop. And that actually was the motto of the school. It was was it? Crest, yeah. Mal and Oya August Chakushi, yeah. 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 With a very good community spirit, I've always enjoyed it. But again, you've got to give to, you've got to blend in yourself to make sure you get that return. And we are, without being selfish, but I think that's what a community is about. Everyone blends in together and you do your bit. Thank you.